Um, sorry about that. Um, good evening. And great to be here back in the house of the Lord tonight. And thank you so much for uh, returning back. And uh, I got to say, I know that uh, Brother Lee is um, prepared, I guess, to come back next Sunday. Um, my wife and I have so thoroughly enjoyed these last two weeks and uh, so counted an honor to be with you. And, uh, thank you so much for your faithfulness and uh, thank you for um, you were put up with us, but I probably wouldn't be made correct, but I do thank you for putting up with us, or me anyway, I should say. Um, you have inspired me, though. You have inspired me. Last week we made a joke about um, turning your books to uh, your Bibles to the book of Jonah. And, uh, and uh, that inspired me because I figured I'm going to do another thing tonight that I've never done probably in the 30 years of ministry. And that's actually going to try to complete a sermon um, uh, all the way through. My wife, every time we, we go preach somewhere, she always takes notes. She's always telling me, she says, man, if I could just get past that, that point number one, I would be able to really understand what you're actually trying to say. So tonight, being inspired by the book of Jonah and your pastor going through it and taking a whole year to go through uh, the first chapter, um, I thought I would find the liberty if you would please take your Bibles and turn to what we talked about last week, Romans 8, 28. Romans 8, 28. You thought, man, you preached all that and you only got through one idea? I said, yeah, yeah, I guess so. Amen. I know uh, Brother Seth and Brown sent me the, the tape of it, and I listened to it. And my, I told my wife, I said, oh, great, we got this on the, on the email. I said, let's listen to it. She said, I'm out of here. I'm going to watch TV. I'm like, what, are you serious? She wouldn't even listen to it. She wouldn't even listen to it with me. But anyway, that's fine. That's fine. So be ready to write tonight, honey. I promise. We're going to really smoke through this thing. We're going to be all over it. I'm sure we'll be all all the rest of the verses that we had intended to. In Romans 8, 28, very familiar verse of Scripture, if you'll stand, uh, if you'll stand real quick, we'll read it, and then we'll uh, uh, have prayer, and then see what we have, the Lord has for us. We see here Paul writing, and he says this in Romans 8, 28, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. Now, Father, tonight we thank you for these very special um, uh, evening. We thank you for the honor to come back to your house, open your word, to be able to hear what you have to say for us. Thank you for these dear folks, Father, for their um, coming back and their commitment to you, to come back and hear your word preached, that, uh, Father, you would help us all to grow more into the likeness of Christ. We thank you for this time together. Bless this word, and Lord, we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Remember, we talked about last week, real quick, just as a matter of, uh, of uh, um, um, kind of going back over it. We talked about, remember, how the verse does not say that all things are good, but the verse says that all things work together for good. The glorious, amazing, wonderful truth about Romans chapter 8, we talked about, is that we are reminded that even though sin and Satan are powerful, God is even more powerful. God is able to redeem and restore anything for His glory and His purpose and work them together for good to them that love God. Remember, we talked about to know men, to perceive with certainty, to know, to understand clearly, to have a clear and certain perception of truth. In other words, to know that God has a plan for my life. To know that God is working according to a fixed eternal purpose. And to know that nothing ever catches God by surprise. Realize tonight I brought that little simple illustration last week about the jigsaw puzzle and how that we talked about is that the, the all things were all the pieces in that puzzle. And how that we understand is that we try to put those pieces where they go, sometimes it just doesn't make sense. Sometimes we just can't figure it out. Sometimes we don't think the pieces are going to fit there. But if we continue on, eventually the pieces fit exactly where they are designed to fit. We talked about the note that all things work together for good. 
We talked about the for good part is the manufacturer who designed the puzzle, who put the picture on the lid of the puzzle so that when it was all said and done, we would be able to look at what we have done and look at what the manufacturer designed for it to be and we could say, oh, I see it now. There it is. And so tonight, as we go through this, we want to talk about a little bit more about some things that we are to know. We talked about last week to be able to know for sure that you are saved or how you have been born again. Remember, when we talked about being born again, we talked about that verse of Scripture as a matter of, of going back over some of this. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, the Bible says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, or literally a people for a possession. Remember that word peculiar. If you remember, we talked about meaning that, in, that God had formed this priesthood to take possession of as God's own special people. Remember, the word peculiar means literally that God has chosen me and is doing so. He has taken rightful ownership of me. Remember, when God says in his Bible, in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, that we are not our own, that we are bought with a price, and therefore we are to glorify God in our body and our spirit, remember the last key words, which are God's. The simple truth tonight is, in, re in reference to knowing that you are saved, you must understand that you were saved because God willed for you to be saved. We understand, we sung it tonight, and the dear sister almost did my whole sermon by music tonight. That amazing grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found. Was blind, but now I see. To be spiritually lost means that you are separated from God without any hope of your way to God. Now remember, and you think about that, when you talk about being separated from God, literally, literally means that you and I are over here in our own little world, doing our own little lost thing, doing our own, walking our own way, and God is pleading with us, or calling to us, and we are not doing or, or, or listening to that call. But that doesn't stop God. He continues on and on to draw us. Remember, the Bible clearly teaches that lost people, lost people, those without a personal relationship with Christ, cannot find God on their own for salvation. Not only that, but really the sadness of that statement, let me read it to you this way, teaches, the Bible teaches that, th that people without a personal relationship with Christ will not find God on their own. It's not that you cannot find God on your own. Literally, the Bible teaches that you will not find God because that is not in our possibilities. Now, and you say, gee, Brother George, you have some Bible for that? I do, matter of fact. If you would take your Bibles, and if you would just flip back just a couple pages, and let's read that. Romans chapter 3. Kind of doing a little bit here, so my wife will have something to write down. So she'll really actually think, I really do know how to preach. Amen? So Romans chapter 3, the Bible says in verse 10. You ready? You got to say Amen. See, it's important. Why do you do stuff like this? Is because I want you to know this is not something I just schemed up. This is something God is trying to help people understand I mean, in His Word so they will come to truth. And when they come to truth, the Bible says that they will be set free. Okay? So in Romans chapter 10, Paul's writing, he says in verse 10, And it's written, there is how many? None. There you go. Huh? The Bible says, the Word of God said, God Himself declares the truth that the Bible says that there is none righteous, no, how many? None. Not one. I, I'm telling you that how specific is that idea. It's not that you cannot come to God, that you, you will not come to God in that relationship. Let's go on in case you don't understand what He's trying to say. In verse 11, the Bible says, 
There is none that understandeth. Here it is. There is how many? None, none that seeketh after God. Okay? Now, this is talking about you and me before we had that special relationship with Jesus Christ. Just in case you get the wrong idea about how wonderful you were, okay? I'm telling you right now, you was wicked as hell, amen? Just like I was, amen? And God had drawn us and called us because we were not seeking after God. The Bible says none. That means not any. Not one single person on planet Earth has ever sought for God. Do you hear me? When you were lost, you were not seeking for God. You were not looking for God. If God had not come looking for you, you'd still be lost. That's right. According to the Bible. Now, I don't know how that makes your flesh feel, but I really don't give a rip, amen. Because the Bible says you did not seek God. You could not seek God. You could not find your way to God. And you kept looking. You looked at every single hole you could find. You looked at work. You looked at money. You looked at faith. You looked at popularity. You looked at everything to make significant to your life, but nothing worked. Why? Because the only thing that fills that void is God Himself. Let's read on. Let's see how wonderful verse 12 is to us. And they all gone out of the way. They were all together become unprofitable. Here it is. There is how many? None. None. There is how many? None that doeth good. How many? No, not one. So you see, when you talk about being saved, you begin to understand really what that means and the process that God went through so that you and I can talk about being saved. When we talk about that, we immediately understand, I did not go looking for God. I did not. Everything I did was not good. Everything I did could do absolutely nothing to find my way to God. That's what makes it so amazing. That's what makes it so wonderful. That's what makes it so spectacular. And we understand it wasn't about what I was doing. It was always about what God was doing. You see, the Bible says here, in, the Bible says in John chapter 6, verse 44, no man can come to me. Now this is in your Bible if you have a red letter edition. Not that it matters because the Bible is all inspired by God. It is all inerrant. It is all infallible whether Paul's talking or Peter's talking or John talking or whoever's talking. It's all truth. Amen. But Jesus himself just so he can clear up any misconception around all of the religious people. He said, let me tell you a little bit of truth. Now, y'all tell you right up front, you ain't going to like this. You ain't going to feel real good about this. But Jesus said, no man comes after me, period. Here it is. Except, here's that clause for you to pay attention to, except the Father which has sent me, draw him. Now we know this to be true because over in the book of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 says, And you whom he hath quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sin. Now I'm not trying to get all, 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 all like crazy here, but have you remember the last time you ever went to a funeral? The reason there was a funeral is because there was a dead man or a dead person, a dead individual lying in that casket. There's one thing about a dead person. A dead person is just a person that is dead. Do you not get that? That's why they are in that casket and they're not doing absolutely nothing. Because there is absolutely nothing they can do. And that's how you and I were before Christ drawed us to himself. We were literally, absolutely dead in 
When you try to grab a hold of Romans 8, 28, you've got to understand the process for you and I to be able to sit here and talk about being saved. It's more than, like I said last week, it's more than just signing a card. It's more than just coming down and joining the church. It's more than just being religious. It's more than just being a Baptist. It's more than just being a Pentecostal. It's more than just that. It's the fact that you were dead and that had Jesus not came to where you were and breathed life into your dead body, you'd still be dead. You see, if we don't ever get a hold of how dead we were and how hopeless we were, our salvation will never mean to us what God intends for it to be. Huh? Our salvation, if you don't understand where you came from and where God came to get you, your salvation will be no more to you than hell insurance. Your salvation will be no more than a fire plan to keep you out of the grips and the depths of hell. But I'm telling you, God did so much more than to just keep you and I out of the portals of hell. God poured His life into our life so that we could have life. Amen. Amen. Uh, do you yes. hear me tonight? You have life. Amen. Because life itself breathes life into you. Do you not see? tonight. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm glad tonight that the Lord Jesus Christ, according to the Word of God, lives inside my body and He's a living God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm glad I'm saved. I'm glad I'm saved. I'm glad I'm saved. Amen. Huh? Yeah, think about it. Think of the alternative. Think about your options. They're real slim. Huh? Sit there and talk about it. Yeah. Think about it. Think what God did for the lost that we could not do for ourselves. Think about it. The Son of God let the splendor of heaven to find me and bring me to himself. In Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve sinned, the Bible says that they heard God coming in the cool of the evening. And the Bible said they realized that they were naked and they hid themselves. That didn't stop God from coming. Hallelujah. That day when he came into the garden, he knew exactly what happened. Hallelujah. He knew that day when he said, Adam, where art thou? God knew exactly where Adam was because God knew exactly what Adam did. Because God was already ready to kill that lamb and to kill that animal and clothe them out of the clothes of skin. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. I don't know about you, but hallelujah. I remember when God came looking for me. Amen. And it was a voice you could not deny. It was something you could not run from. Amen. It was something that when that voice logged out, you knew it was God himself. That's how much God loves you tonight. That's how much God loves me tonight. That God left the splendor of heaven for me. Huh? Listen, we have got to wrap our hearts around this. The Bible said that lesbian brown, the become of sin, the gulf between us and God was impossible for us to bridge and we could not find our way back into his presence. First Peter 2. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, listen to this. For Christ also had once suffered for sin, the just for the unjust. Do you not understand that? God was just. God was holy. God was pure. God was sinless. God was God. God was hanging on a tree, dying for my sin, the just for the unjust, the dirty, the filthy, the wretched, the transgressor. And when I mean transgressor, just so you don't think you're a really good person, I tell you tonight, the transgressor means when we transgress in our sins, we deliberately rebelled against the authority of God, and we literally chose not to follow after God because we were dead in our sins, and we didn't want to try to find out how to become alive. Amen. Amen. No, we turned to drugs. We turned to alcohol. We turned to sex. We turned to money. We turned to fame. We turned to everything else. You know what I'm 
telling you the truth. Amen. You're sitting there and acting like you all that, but I know you ain't. Amen. And you can tell Pastor Lee not to have me back. That's fine too. Huh? But I want us to know tonight when we go out of here how precious it is to be saved. Amen. Amen. Huh? Yeah. I'm glad I'm saved. Yes. You realize tonight that God to be saved means that you humbly receive God's gift of salvation through faith because of His grace. You getting something you did not deserve. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Do you understand? You got grace. You got something you did not deserve. You got something that you did not earn. You got something that was not owed to you. You got grace. Amen. You know what that is? Grace is God's God's God <laughs> God's riches at Christ's expense. You realize God did not spare one thing to save your and my wretched soul. God did not hold back nothing. God gave it all. God presented all. God gave it all. God gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Though you deserve to perish. Though you deserve to die and go to hell because of your rebelling against God. God said, no sir, I love you that much. I love you that much. And I'm going to come and I'm going to draw you to myself. And I'm going to make you a child of God. I'm going to bring life into your bosom. And for the first time you are going to be alive. That's what I'm talking about. Huh? I'm telling you what tonight. I'm not laying in that casket, hallelujah. Huh? No, sir. And I'm not trying to be morbid. I'm just trying to give you a visual understanding of how lost you really were. Huh? You know what that helps you do? That realizes, helps you realize how saved you really are. Huh? You give some Bible for that there little idea. Huh? Where God transfers your sins in divine exchange to the cross and transfers Christ's righteousness to your account. Oh, God. <laughs> huh? Yeah. Do you not get that? That's like you a poor man and somebody that's rich has a lot of money and he went down to the bank tomorrow and says, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do, Mr. Banker. I got some money here and oh, he don't deserve it, but I'm going to put this money into this man's account. I'm going to take it, I'm going to put it right in his account and I'm going to impute it to him as something he did not earn, something he does not deserve, but I'm going to do it in spite of him, amen. That's what God did on Calvary. He took my sin. He nailed them to the cross. And he took the righteousness of God Almighty and imputed that righteousness to my account, my sinful account, my transgression account. That's what God did for me at Calvary. Yep. <laughs> Amen. How? Huh? How about this? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 22. The Bible says, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ, A-L-L, all be made alive. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. How about this? 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he, who's that? God, made him, who's that? Jesus, to be sin for us. Who's that? George Carnes. Huh? So I know we're with King James Bible. I get that. But let's just read that in a little different translation if we could. You ready? For God had made Jesus to be sin for George Carnes. Huh? Yeah. Say it with me and you put your name in there and see how that feels to you. Amen. See what that does to that spirit of God inside of your heart. Amen. You say you're saved. The Bible says that His Spirit bear record with our spirit. Amen. And I want one, one thing tonight. I want God's Spirit to know that in my spirit I am glad that He put His account on my account. Even though I did not deserve it, God chose to love me in spite of myself. And He Huh? 
21. Who knew no sin. That we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Huh? I'm telling you what. Can you understand in the book of Isaiah chapter 64, in you and I, there is absolutely zero righteousness at all. Amen? The Bible says we are as filthy rag. But now, because of what Jesus Christ did, you and I, according to the word of God, get this now, not according to you, not according to me, but according to the word of God, you now are clothed in the righteousness of God himself. Do you not understand who you are tonight? You're not just some misfit. You're not just some afterthought. You're not just something that God didn't have nothing else to do. So he just decided to change your life. No. You are in the heart of God. A dearly beloved. And God said I'm going to pay whatever price I have to pay to redeem you. And I'm going to take your sin. I'm going to nail it to my son on the cross. I'm going to take his righteousness and I'm going to put it on your life. Talk about being a new creature in Christ Jesus. Huh? First Peter chapter 2, the Bible says, Who in his own self bear our sin in his own body on the tree that we, being dead to sin, should live under righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. You know what that literally means? When they had Jesus tied to that whipping post, that should have been you. When Jesus laid there that day and willfully exposed his back to that cat and nine tail, and the Bible says that he went as a lamb unto the slaughter, and yet he opened not his mouth. You realize that they literally poured the flesh off of his bones to the point where he could hardly even be recognized as an individual human being. That was a flesh that should have been ripped off your bone for your sin. And even at that, that would have been enough payment for the penalty of sin because the penalty of sin is death, amen. That's what we deserve. But what we got is a righteousness of a holy, almighty, loving God. Can you not say hallelujah, amen? amen. You're about to amen. kill me, amen. Hallelujah. Are you kidding me? Huh? I don't know if you had anybody other than maybe me preaching, but not willfully, not on purpose. I don't know if you ever had anybody spit in your face, but I don't imagine that was a pleasant thing. Huh? Literally stand there and spit in the face of Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. That's what he was willing to go through for you. Huh? Isaiah 53 says this, For me, in my place, Christ was despised. In my place, Christ was rejected. In my place, he was a man of sorrow. In my place, Christ was a man of grief. In my place, he was smitten of God and afflicted. Huh? Do you get the picture? This was not a pretty sight. This was not something that God took lightly. This was something that God willfully planned. It was a plan A. There was never a plan B. God exactly knew what he would do to save George Carr. And he didn't change his mind one bit. It was a fixed eternal purpose. And God said whatever it takes, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to pay that price. Because I love him that much. And though my son would be despised, though my son would be rejected, though my son would be a man of sorrow, though my son would be afflicted, though my son would be wounded with my transgressions, though my son would be bruised for George Carson's iniquity. Though 
I think it's somewhere over there around Matthew chapter 20, where Jesus said, I, uh, I didn't come to be ministered to. Oh, no. <laughs> but I come to minister. I come to serve. <laughs> yeah. I come to give my life as a ransom for many. That's why I came. Oh, yeah. Jesus wasn't walking along the Sea of Galilee just because he was, just cause he, was uh, he was on vacation. Huh? Jesus comes out of heaven and how sunny is that? Well, where are you going today, Jesus? Well, God, I heard Galilee's a nice vacation spot. I think we'll go down there and hang out down there for a while, maybe do a little fishing. Huh? No. Jesus came out of heaven, stepped out of glory, and did everything he did for you and I. And now, all the way, when God Scoop that dust out of that ground. Watch this now. He created man in his own image. You see, God created you even before you were formed in your mother's womb with a godly purpose. Now get this, that only you are gifted to do. You read the book of Corinthians, chapter, 1 Corinthians, I believe it's chapter 12. And you read it for yourself. God placed every single member into the body. Here it is. As it pleased him. Not you. Because God, being God, knows exactly what you are capable of doing. Yeah, hallelujah. Yeah. And that's God's ultimate goal. To get you into the image of Christ because he knows the job that he specifically has for you. And if he don't get you from point A to point B, you ain't going to be nothing but a good spectator. Hmm. They don't call it ministry just because they couldn't come up with another word. Huh? They don't call it serving the Lord just because it sounds good in a business meeting. Huh? What you doing? Oh, I'm serving the Lord. Oh, what you doing? Well, I'm just serving the Lord. Well, I mean, okay. What are you doing? Oh, I go to church on Sunday. Ooh. Now, I'm not minimizing that. Trust me. I'm not trying to be, I'm not being unkind. I'm just saying you know how far away we are from hitting the mark of what God intends for each of us to, to be doing? Are you kidding? Because you might not know that. I'm fixing to tell you. <laughs> A little segue. You see how I did that? You didn't know I was that smart, did you? I'm not. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. Listen. The Bible, when it talks about, that Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, and the rest of that other verse we talked about being chosen. Here's why. That ye should bring forth the praise of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Huh? Oh yeah, you are peculiar people. God purchased you for His rightful ownership. But that's not the only reason God did that. God is the owner of George Carnes. I am not my own. I belong to him. That's why it is my reasonable service. According to Romans chapter 12 verse 1. It's logical for me to understand when we study the word of God. And see all that God did for George Carnes. It's but logical. That I present my body. A living, holy sacrifice to God, which is my reasonable service. Huh? Reasonable service. Key word, service. Huh? Take your Bibles and flip over real quick. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Let's see what this service entails. When you get there, say Amen. 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 First, I'm sorry. Second Corinthians chapter four. That was a trick. 
to see how fast you turn the Bible. Second Corinthians chapter four, when you sit get there, say amen. Actually, I did that so I could get another sip of water, and you all about to kill me up here. <coughs> hey, baby, we on point two. We getting close. I mean, we close. We close. Keep that pen ready. Don't tell him we might get there. Amen. You there? Say amen. amen. All right, here we go. You ready? Here it is. What's our reasonable service? Look with me, if you would, in verse three. In verse three, the Bible said. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid, to, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not. Lest, lest, you see that? Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, who is in the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Jesus, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants. For Jesus' sake, verse 6, For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts. For what reason? Just so we can shine in our hearts? No! It's so that to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you understand that the ministry that you and I have been given is to shine that light of the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know why we're called to do that? It's because God shined that light in you and I first. Amen. I see you didn't get that like I got that. Huh? Do you understand what you have? You have the light of the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not just the gospel. It's the glorious gospel. Hmm? Yeah. How about that? Look at verse 1 in chapter 4 where you're at right now. Therefore, seeing we have this what? Ministry. As we have received mercy, we faint not. What ministry is he talking to? Well, you're right there in the neighborhood. So just go over there, maybe across the page, over there to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 in verse 17. Are you there? Say amen. amen. All right, here we go. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit that God was in Christ reckoning the world unto himself, not imputing their transgressions unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Do you know what that means? The ministry of reconciliation involved the proclamation of the gospel. And it is, it is assurance that forgiveness of sin is available to all. Now, let's just break that down and understand how what that literally means. <laughs> that God came to you and He saved you. He drew you to Himself. He did that because He has something amazing He is trying to accomplish for your life and through your life. And as God did that, He put the ministry or the glorious light, the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ inside of you. And the reason He did that is so that you, under the caption, the ministry of reconciliation, would take that light and show it forward to the other people that are still in darkness. Amen. Amen. What? You mean there's more to it than the four and no more? Oh yeah. Trust me. No more truer than in the days of Jesus. The fields are wide already unto harvest. Huh? Yeah, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Huh? You talking about moving out of here to a new building? I'm going to tell you what, you ought, what we ought to be praying. We ought to be praying that God already gets that, that harvest field prepared. Huh? If not, don't, don't waste the time to go down there and spend money on another building just so you can hang a sign on the street corner and call it whatever name you want to call it and not do what God has intended you for you and I to do. Amen. Amen. Yes, right. You talk about a mission statement. What again, it's your words. It's not my words. This is what you guys came up with. Huh? Hope it wasn't just some fancy, pretty slogan that you could put on your announcement sheet. 
Do you get a little head like this right here? So I know you're thinking I'm telling you the truth, because I am. Amen. Huh? Amen. Yeah. The glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you kidding me? The word gospel literally means God's pill for a sick people. Oh, I get it. You and I are doctors that have the most amazing cure ever known to man. But we're not going to give it to you. Huh? That's how ridiculous that sounds. Oh, I can cure your cancer, but I'm not telling you. Huh? I can put your marriage back to bed, but I'm not going to show you how to do that. <laughs> I got my wife. She loves me. I love her. We're right. It's all good in my house. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You can believe this truth right here. There's people out there in darkness like you, you and I cannot even imagine. Huh? You know why they're not coming inside this church? Because they, they, they're in such darkness they don't even know how to get here. Just like you were a long time ago when God came to you, you were in utter darkness. I'm not talking about just having a bad day, buddy. I'm talking about black dark. I'm talking about the darkest of dark. I'm talking about the most lonely of lonely. I'm talking about the time of misery. I'm talking about the time of sorrow. I'm talking about the time of pain. You and I are going to sit around in here and know the truth. Have a light of the glorious gospel. Do you not see? God said, this is the ministry that I have given you. Amen. Thank you. Yeah, that's what I gave you. Now what you going to do with it? Huh? Look. The reason people aren't flooding the church by the grove is not that they know that their life is miserable. They got that. Because they're trying to hide that. They're trying to have Jack Daniels help them with that problem. And he ain't going to help them. Huh? They're trying to help marriage or want to help them with that problem. But that ain't going to help them. Huh? They're trying everything they can try, but nothing's going to work. Because the only thing that brings things out of darkness is if light Hallelujah. exposes yes. that darkness. Amen. Hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You and I do not even have a clue. Huh? I'll tell you one thing for sure. At the judgment of God, we're going to have a clue. Amen? Yeah. And I'm not trying to scare you into going out there and serving Jesus. If you ain't going to do that on your own, out of your own grateful heart, you ain't going to do it no matter what I tell you, no matter what preacher ever tells you. Huh? You got to do that out of the gratefulness of your heart because you have life. You have hope. You have glory. So why can't they have it? Huh? Yeah. Huh? What makes you so special? What makes me so special? Jesus. Zero. Nothing. The only thing that makes me special is God calling me and drawing me. How do you know? How do you know? How do I know that that person standing on the cross the counter for me at the checkout, how do I know that that's not the person God has intended me to cast a light into their dark soul so they can have hope, so they can realize life doesn't have to be the way it is? not true. You know. But if you and I don't go looking for it, we'll never find out. Yeah. You don't do it, and I don't do it because it's some kind of a quota. I didn't talk to anybody about you. Oh, man, I, I talked to so many people about Jesus this week. It's crazy. No. We do it because that's the job God's given us. You are literally a representative of God. Verse 20 of that chapter, 2 Corinthians, Corinthians chapter 5, that says that we are ambassadors of Christ. You know what an ambassador is? He is a representative of another country. 
This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasure is all laid up somewhere beyond the blood. That's your interruption. specific for you and I to do and that is to shed the light the glorious gospel light of the Lord Jesus Christ got a couple more minutes let me let me share this with you real quick one of the most greatest there are so many but let me just say a great Bible scripture is Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 and 9 you don't have to turn there you know it, it says for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. Can you say amen? Amen. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Oh, wait a minute. My King James Bible, there's a verse 10. Imagine that. God wasn't through telling us how. Somebody here knows 
how to turn on the lights. Mm. That's what our job is. In the real sense, that's the message of the gospel. The light is available. Even when darkness seems overwhelming, and we, the church, the body of Christ, has now has and knows how to turn on that. Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, before we go to the last <coughs> one. The Bible says, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it gives light unto all that are in the house. You ready? The Bible says, as a command, not as a suggestion, not as a good Sunday, good idea. The Bible says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Now we all agree that God's pretty big. Would you agree with that? I mean, think about it. The Bible says in Genesis that God created everything out of nothing. That's a pretty big God. Would you not say that? Yes. But watch this. this. This is mind blowing. Watch this. According to Matthew chapter 5, the Bible says, I'll let your light so shine. I'm not talking about just flicker. I'm talking about, I'm talking about burning that thing, baby. Let it shine. Let it shine, hey man. And when you do that, here what the Bible says. That it, your good works glorify your Father which are in heaven. You know what that literally means, glorify? That means to magnify or make larger God. Are you kidding me? How in the world is it possible to make God larger than God already is? Well, to a lost person in darkness, not very hard. Because they know absolutely nothing about the goodness of God. You know how God's you know how God shines and glories. Because you've been here, you know that you've done that. But the person you're gonna to meet tomorrow, wherever you go, they don't have a, a clue what that even means. We're talking about making God bigger. You know how you do that? Through your good works. Glorify God in your good works. Huh? That's not, I didn't put that in there. God wrote that. Huh? Matter of fact, I believe you have a red letter edition. That's Jesus himself. Huh? Yeah. Not that that matters. According to Timothy <laughs> chapter 3. Third thought. Here we go. Not only are you to know how you were saved, not only are you to know what you were saved for, but the third thought tonight, and we're going home, you and I must know who it is that opposes what we're doing. Mm. You see, all this, whether you call it good or not, all this preaching, all this screaming, all this edifying, all this stuff we're doing, what we must understand, the devil is not going to throw himself upon the seat somewhere and say, boy, that church is really going at it now. I guess I lost that one. No, sir, not on your life. The Bible says we wrestle not against principalities, but power and high. I'll guarantee you, he is out to steal, to kill, destroy everything about what we are trying to do here tonight. You understand this truth? Um, A.W. Tozer said it this way in the close of his ministry. It's not that Christians don't want to win. They don't even know they are at war. Listen, and I'm not, you want to shut the tape off because you don't want to get in trouble, go ahead and feel free to do that. But I'm going to tell you right now, 
I'm telling you right now, everything that's going on in Washington, D.C. is against everything you and I are doing here tonight. If you want to talk about separation of church and state, that's a bunch of hokey pokey, amen? I'm telling you, they got one reason and one reason only. They are out to stop everything you and I are all about. They don't want you proclaiming the gospel. They don't want to know. They don't want you to tell people how to get out of bondage because if people in bondage are exactly the people that make them strive, amen? What I'm trying to tell you is this. Life is not going to be easy. You and I are inside a war. There make no mistake about it. The devil is real. He is out to stop everything you and I are doing here tonight. And he don't care how he does that. Right. Right. Amen. Amen. Thank you. you see him on your picture screen at home? All those visual aids of Ukraine. All them buildings destroyed. All them lives ruined. All them lives killed. That ain't nothing compared to the warfare that Satan is raging against the church and the body of Christ. You know why we don't realize that? Because we don't even realize it's real. Huh? Yeah. The reason you look at me like, oh man, Brother George, that's, 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 that's just a little bit, that. that sounds like a little bit too much conspiracy theory to me. No, the devil has done exactly what he set out to do. All he's doing is just a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit here. Well, a long time ago, they took out Bible reading in school. A long time ago, they took out prayer in school. Now they took out discipline in school. Now you can't even talk about God. The only thing you can do is have Satan club after hours where they tell you there ain't no God and all this is a hocus pocus. Right. Yeah. Listen. The last I checked, the name on the outside of this church was King Road Baptist Church, not New Fellowship Ostrich Church. Huh? So what you talking about, preacher? I'm talking about it's time for you and I to get our heads out of the sand and get them where the battle is and realize if we don't go to war, there are going to be a defeat. Listen, if the church, the Bible says that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Do you get that truth? But in that truth, God is saying the church, the body of Christ, that belongs to me. The devil is never going to be able to conquer that because the devil will never conquer God. Amen. But he'll sure stop you and I. Yeah. Huh? Right. He'll do everything he can to destroy our homes, destroy our marriages, destroy our morality. Are you kidding? It's a mess we're in. It's all because we've just been lulled to sleep in happy, happy land. Huh? Ooh, this is nice. Huh? Old preacher Lester Roloff said, it's a battlefield. It's a battlefield, not a recreation room. It's a, it's a fight and not a game. Run if you want to. Run if you will. But I came here to stay. Listen, what we need to do is put on our big boy pants and our big girl pants and understand we are in the fight of our life. Satan hates everything about what we're doing. But he goes about it so craftily, so careful, so meticulous that we don't even know he's already in the front door. Huh? This is real life, folks. Huh? Why I love when my grand I love being around my grandkids. You know why? Because I want them to know this isn't a bunch of joke stuff. This is a real life. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm kind of an older fella now, 66 years old, you know, getting way up in their age. But I'm going to tell you what. You think this little bit of church stuff is going to work for them in about five or ten years? 
when they have to start living this stuff out, not on your life. Huh? No telling. Who in this world could have ever imagined we'd, bear, we'd be where we are right now in 2022? Amen. No way. You, you could never even think of this stuff up. Yeah. You couldn't think of this in your wildest imaginations while you and I have been sitting in these shoes all these years. Woo Amen. Woo Hallelujah. Glory. Huh? All this stuff is just being stripped from us. And we don't even understand that it's happening. Because we don't understand that it's warfare. When the Bible talks about we wrestle not against, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but about power and principalities, you know what that literally means? It means, it's a wrestling term that means a great intensity. A picture of a man grasping another, pressing hard, straining every muscle in him to pin him to the ground. I want to challenge you tonight to know this truth. It's amazing to me when you look in the life of Job. I'll close with this thought. You look in the life of Job, and you see in Job chapter 1, the Bible says Job lost everything he had. The sheep, the camel, the donkeys, the daughters, the sons, he lost it all. The Satan came and told God, let me tell you what's going to do. If you take your hand off God, I'll tell you what, I'll take everything from him and he'll curse you. And God said, okay, all right, I'm down for that. God said, don't you, you just can't take his life. The devil said, that's fine. That's fine. I don't need to take his life right now. I'll, I'll work on that some other time. You just let me have some of those things he's got and I'll guarantee you he'll curse you. Now watch this. All that stuff's gone. Job says at the end of chapter 1, he said, Naked I came into this world, and naked I go out. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Mm. Watch this now. Pay attention. You know how chapter 2 opens up? <laughs> chapter 2 opens up with the same devil doing the same exact thing. Going to and fro, up and down the earth, seeing who he can devour. I'm telling you, the devil did not even miss one beat. Hey, Amen. You know what I'm saying? It didn't matter to the devil how much he destroyed Job's life. Enough was never enough. The devil's always coming back for more. The devil's always coming back to steal. The devil's always coming back to kill. The devil's always coming back to destroy. And God said, where are you been? He said, yeah, I'm still looking. And the devil said, I'm not even done with Job yet. I'm going to tell you, you let me curse him and I'll guarantee he'll curse you. And God said, yeah, okay, go ahead. We'll see how that goes. And you know the Bible said that the devil touched him from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet with sword. And yet Job still didn't curse God. Amen. But that didn't cause the devil to run. With his tail tucked between his legs. He just kept on going. He kept on going. Thought he could get a job through his wife. Cursing God and die. Thought he could get the job through his real, his real three friends. Listen, here's the story tonight. It's this simple. We are so blessed. We are the children, the children of God. And not only that, we have been given a very special ministry. I mean, how did you get saved, sir? Well, really, I just realized I was lost and I called upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and God saved me and it was, I mean, oh, can God do that for me too? Well, yeah, absolutely. It's not rocket science, man. Huh? It's just sharing your story. It's telling your truth. You don't got to be a theologian. Just tell them how you found the light. <coughs> huh? And then we realize we're in the fight of our life tonight. And if we don't know that and we don't set for that and be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, roareth about seeking whom he may devour. Mm -hmm. If we don't put that in up here tonight, we will be destroyed. The 
church, the body of Christ, it's always God's institution and God says the gates of hell is not going to overtake that. But your life and my life, if the devil can stop us from doing what God has called us to do, he has won that battle. Father, tonight, thank you, dear God, for the gospel truth. I thank you, dear God, that you literally took my sins placed them on the Lord Jesus Christ at Mount Calvary and you took his righteousness and placed them to my account. I am so overwhelmed and blessed to know that for by grace I was saved through faith. Father, I thank you, dear God, tonight that you have given me a very specific ministry that I am to go out and share the glorious light of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ, to go out and tell people what God has literally done in my life, in my family, in my children's life, in my grandchildren's life. Just go tell the story. Oh God, when we go tell the story, you do what only you can do, and that is draw men unto yourself. So God, help us, and help us tonight, God, to be sober, to be vigilant, because that adversary is a roaring lion, seeketh and roameth about seeking whom he may devour. Thank you for tonight. Thank you for these dear and precious people coming out this evening to sit around your word. Thank you for meeting for us and with us tonight. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, I don't know if you need to come to the altar tonight. Maybe you just need to come to the altar tonight and just get before God and say, just thank you for saving me. I don't know. I don't know.